prepared to answer that question, there's an unplanned reminder from Estonia, apparently the most digitally advanced nation in the world. 46% of those casting their vote in last elections in Estonia did that online using either one of these guys or one of these guys to do so, which also makes the 2020 US presidential elections look like a joke, frankly. It's from where I'm standing, looking at people by the thousands, lining up for hours, wearing masks during a global pandemic to exercise their democratic rights is beyond funny, frankly. So I'll be looking at the lessons from the modern world in how to securely accelerate digital transformation and therefore survive the global pandemic. And what a day it is to be looking at that. These pictures of just two weeks ago in the US Capitol meant that the presidential inauguration um, apparently has eaten my pictures in the slides. Oh well, the good news is my slides are quite visuals heavy. But it meant the national celebration of rule of law based rituals, the presidential inauguration, happened with almost no people in attendance, but instead 25,000 National Guardsmen in there. And that's, of course, not just because of the pandemic, but because of the lesson Estonia learned already in 2007. And as our uh, uh, pr uh, previous president, Thomas Henrik Ilves, says, every time the world discovers how interconnected politics and our uh, digital way of life and therefore democracy and needing to secure our digital way, way of life is, the Baltics simply laugh. Because 2007 was eerily similar to things that have happened in the United States since 2016, in that we've been reminded that to enjoy the digital way of life, that way of life also needs to be secured. And cybersecurity is the necessary cost of a modern world. And it's all very much integrated with politics. Uh, of course, the modern world adds further complexity in a world where everything is connected. There's expected to be probably five times as many connected devices in the world as there are people. Think of that, five times as many. And that digi digital ecosystem needs to be secured very much in the way previous speakers have already highlighted. And so to throw a further cha challenge into the mix of complexity, 2020, of course, a year ago, gave us the curveball of a global pandemic when our uh, offices stopped looking like offices, wearing proper clothes became a rare treat. And that's what our working clothes look like, a pair of slippers. The previous speakers have already, already highlighted how it wasn't as tough for Estonia as it was for many others, because to facilitate that accelerated digital transition, some places it got accelerated by more than a decade, we have in place a data exchange layer, X-Road, which is basically the UXP product my colleagues provide, as well as reasonable connectivity, a secure digital identity embedded in the chip and pin of my ID card or the crypto SIM card of my phone. But it also taught us lessons that I think go well beyond Estonia. In first of all, what we cannot change, what is the uncertainty that we have to accept in the modern world. First of all, it is that cyber attacks will always take place, as Thomas Reed very succinctly titled his book, if you've not read it, by the way, go and do that right away. And you have to accept that the only system that's secure is a system that's unplugged at the bottom of the ocean and buried under 
concrete. But the availability of such a system leaves a little to be desired, let alone usability of it. And we've also learned that cybersecurity is fundamentally integrated with geopolitics and the most detrimental of cyber attacks are those that are sponsored or at least inspired by nation state actors. No, Petya not Petya and WannaCry, those most costly globally thus far, most would argue, have been, have been attributed to the Russian Federation and North Korea. Um, which also means that regardless of where we are, we know that spies are going to spy. Meaning that in a global pandemic, it might have moved spycraft into a new domain, but those powerful advanced persistent threat actors who can do most damage, as also demonstrated by the solar winds Orion breach that affected many government agencies across the world, inc including those in charge of security, both in the US and, and several European countries, are, were taking advantage of the pandemic and, and the, so were the reactive opportunistic attackers. Um, and we know that vulnerabilities are inevitable, particularly, again, as highlighted by the solar winds Orion, where as software comes together from components, it also means that down the supply line, as Raul Rick highlighted, there will be vulnerabilities. Which brings us to what we can change. And first and foremost, that is to build a resilient ecosystem of facilitators that allow you to live a secure life. And in Estonia, to build that digital habit, that means a secure digital identity, whether it's again a chip and pin solution, whether it's a SIM and uh, whether it's a SIM and PIN solution or whether it's the seamless solution that my colleagues at Cybernetica have been, builded, have been building called SplitKey, which is based on the idea that eventually our phones might be uh, seamless and therefore we need to be doing mobile identity without reliance on a SIM card. So that's SplitKey for you. You have to be able to take sector-specific measures, and that is particularly true in medicine, as that is a fundamentally vulnerable sector. And as you're building a security culture, that has to be all-encompassing. Nothing is a better example than the Estonian Hoya app, the contact tracing app, developed based to a great degree on cybernetic's privacy-preserving preser technologies which showed that to contract, contact track, a trace, regardless of what you think of contact tracing as a public health measure, you can do it in a truly privacy-preserving way where there's no centralized data con uh, collection, there's no centralized processing, there's no personalization of the data, and no information exchange with a central body until a positive diagnosis needs to be confirmed. And the government does not know who's been notified. Truly privacy preserving, no GPS, no such, how, what do we call it in this business? Government surveillance bullshit. You can truly be privacy preserving and that needs to be the central asset of your privacy culture. And approach to private uh, to remote work therefore needs to be beyond perimeter defense which is how we're used to thinking of defending our networks it no longer works which brings us to what everyone can do first and foremost accept that there is uncertainty and think of not avoiding risks but to off your level of risk tolerance Secondly, operational security. How to make sure that those remote workers are secure and particularly they're secure where perimeter defense has shifted back to endpoint defense. You need to be able to identify both your machines and your people, 
which brings us to keeping your house in order. To keep your house in order, you must be building situational awareness. Situational awareness on top of digital identity and secure data exchange is knowing what's going on in your networks, knowing what are the assets, what is the traffic, and so on. And that is what I truly believe in to the extent that I'm building out, out myself the cybersecurity product portfolio at Cybernetica, with which I'll invite you to join us in the breakout session later on today, where we'll be talking about the products of Cybernetica, the probably most research and innovation intense company in Estonia and most likely the Baltic region. Well, uh, Lisa, thank you so much uh, for, for being with us. Uh, we've got several questions for you as well, sure. of course. Uh, but before we do that, we have to deal with the results of the previous poll. Uh, the question was, would you vote online if you could in your country? There were three answers. I'm already doing it. Yes, it would be simpler than going to the polling station, as you suggested as well. Uh, or, uh, no, I don't trust it. My vote can get lost. Uh, and we see that we've got apparently quite a few viewers from Estonia as well who are already doing it. Um, 20 people say, yes, it would be much simpler than going to the polling station. And only three people say, no, I don't trust it. My vote can get lost. Very interesting. Your thoughts on this? I mean, if you say, if you don't trust it, you're saying there isn't enough of maturity in your digital services ecosystem that you trust that. It's a terrifically bad idea to start digitalization from voting, simply because of the very special and sacred nature of elections in a democracy. And of course, I'd like to point out that if you don't run a democracy, this whole question becomes irrelevant. So, but in a democracy, because of how sacred elections are, the digitalization of them needs to rely on the ecosystem and your election should not be any more digital than the governance they support. It certainly shouldn't be the first service that you offer online for population. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but also, on the other hand, I would say, uh, if, you do, if you think that your vote might get lost, don't try postal voting. Um, so um, we've got several questions from the audience. Uh, the first one is, uh, what experience does Cybernetica have in working with governments? So we worked with dozens of governments around the world. We do have, being a company that goes back all the way to the 1960s and quite fundamental research, and still having about one in five of my colleagues holding PhDs, uh, we've been working with the very fundamentals of how the Estonian ecosystem comes together. But then we've done either the fundamental facilitators, so whether it's identity on, or whether it's the secure data exchange layer mm. in dozens of governments and ecosystems around the world, or we've worked with specific areas, be it customs, uh, be it in the defense, other areas, mm. building particular uh, products. But what I've learned about my colleagues is that they're fundamentally incapable of building something that's insecure. That's a very good promise uh, to, to make to future customers as well, I would say. We can't do it. <laughs> um, how do you approach the elderly that don't know how to use the internet and technologies and their tendency not to trust them? I think that's a <coughs> cultural problem and not an age problem. Yes. Uh, what we see, and, and, and voting is a great example because it's quite, the voting behavior of age groups is quite well known using the different methods of voting. And what we know is that young people, despite of how you can vote, don't vote. They simply, and you need, simply by making voting available online in this hip modern digital sphere, does not make youth uh, participation any higher. Mm. And, and similarly, you know, the services and systems you build a, have to rely on that secure ecosystem. You can't expect to train any citizen, any user to use a service, whether it's tax filing, whether it's registering their children for school, that they don't do that often. You can't expect them to learn a habit for that. But you build habit through the ecosystem as, a, as such. You know, by having a secure digital identity that allows you to bank, that allows you to see how your child is progressing in school, that allows you to see your medical history, uh, allows doctors to 
to write prescriptions without physically needing to sign it, because of course doctors' mm. handwritings are so clear anyway. <laughs> Notoriously, so, yeah. <laughs> so you do that by building habit mm. and making it as easy as it would be otherwise. I, th I think the user friendliness aspect is also very important. If you simply digitalize a, a paper document and you don't make it any more user friendly, people won't use it because there's no incentive to use it. Exactly. Uh, Digitalizing stupid just gives you digital stupid. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Um, final question. Uh, I think I know your answer on this, uh, and I agree, um, <laughs> but uh, still we, we have to ask this. Where do you start with cybersecurity in your opinion? Uh, my distinct belief is that you start with the facilitators. There are particular use cases, let's say in disaster recover after natural disasters, or with very dispersed populations, mm. when you start with particular services that are situation specific to those settings. But during peace and prosperity, you know, during some stability at least, you start with building the fundamental facilitators that you then can, anyone can develop services mm. onto. And as I think has been the thread running through the presentation so far, those are identity, a data exchange platform, a data exchange layer that's secure, and, and thirdly, a shared approach to security that is very deeply, in my opinion, embedded not in declarations, but in situational awareness, in understanding what actually is going on. Because if you don't monitor for incidents, mm. you have zero incidents, yeah. but a whole lot of damage. <laughs>